And tonight we're going to look at this church at Thyatira. There are a few things that I want us to keep in mind, though, as we think about this church. The, the, the one thing that I want us to be sure about is that we know these lessons, while they are about these churches, these lessons are about this church. I want us to be very clear about that because what we need to do is be able to learn lessons about what local churches did in the New Testament. We need to benefit as much as we can from what we read about these churches. You know, I don't know if these churches still exist. I don't know if there are New Testament Christians meeting in any of these seven churches, but um, there may be. I don't know. But I will tell you, as I've said to you before, folks, most of the time churches, if they are around long enough, they go in a direction that I think the Lord probably wouldn't prefer. And I, while I don't know that if there are disciples in these towns now, I know that uh, it's probably fairly obvious that there might be a few, but we don't know about that. So we need to learn lessons ourselves about what's going on with us, and that's what these lessons are designed to do. These lessons, of course, of seven churches, I think represent all the churches that were there. The, their culture was affected. They were affected by their culture, like us. What's interesting to me about these churches, there were good things about these churches and there were bad things about these churches. And in some cases, there were good people and in some cases, there were bad people. There were bad people in the church that we're going to talk about tonight. But I suppose that the thing that I want us to make sure we remember the most is this, that God knows. God knows us. He knows everything about us. He knows us better than we know ourselves. And so one of our obligations and one of the things that we want to make sure we do is as we study these churches, is to gain as much as we can to make what we sometimes call an application in our lives and then to the very best of our ability seek to be what God would have us to be. So as we look at this church tonight, continue to keep those things in your mind. Let's begin from the second chapter in verse 18 as, uh, as the Lord really writes this letter to this church. And he says in verse 18, To the angel of the church in Thyatira write, these things says the Son of God who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet like fine brass. I know your works, love, service, faith, and your patience. And as for your works, the last are more than the first. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you because you allow that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and to eat things sacrificed to idols. And I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality. She did not repent. Indeed, I will cast her into a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation, unless they repent of their deeds. I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and the hearts. I will give to each one of you according to your works." Now to you, I say, and to the rest in Thyatira, as many as do not have this doctrine, who have not known the depths of Satan, as they say, I will put on you no other burden. But hold fast what you have till I come. And he who overcomes and keeps my words until the end, to him I will give power over the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron, and they shall be dashed to pieces like the potter's vessels, as I also have received from my Father, and I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. When you look at these seven cities, Thyatira was the smallest of the seven. It was not a tourist stop in the sense as Ephesus was, or Smyrna was, or even Pergamum was. It was not like that. It was very much a business center. It was a commercial center. There were trade guilds. Archaeologists have uncovered a lot of things from the past that show that there were, were many different uh, occupations there. Uh, they found documents to indicate the trade and uh, the commercialism that was there. Well, you remember Acts 16? There was a woman named Lydia whom Paul converted in Philippi, just across, just across the water from where they were. And evidently Lydia, who was, as you well remember, was a seller of purple. She was a businesswoman evidently, and she sold her wares across. She sold herself in, in many parts of the country. 
And she may have even started the church in Thyatira. We really don't know. But it could be that after she was converted by Paul in Acts 16 in Philippi, that when she went back home, she was converted. Or she was converted and when she went back home, she possibly began the church. But it's interesting to me that that's where she was from. And so that would help us understand uh, the commerce that went on in a place like Thyatira. And I think the trade guilds affected the church too, evidently. And we're going to look at that a little bit more as we think more as we get into this lesson a little bit more. But let's notice a couple of things about this, really how Jesus describes himself here. He talks about in verse 18, let me go back and I think I'll just go back and, and show that chart. He talks about in 18, he says, These things says the Son of God who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet like fine brass. If you go back and look at all of these churches, and we've not done that yet, but if you go back and look at all these letters to these churches, there is something said that has reference, at least most of the time, there's at least one indication that's not about the vision that John saw, but most of these letters begin with some phase or some form of the vision which John saw. And so he's going back, and I think he's doing that to make sure that they understand just who they're dealing with. In this particular letter, he talks about in verse 18, he talks about him being the Son of God, the Lord being the Son of God. And I think that's really what he's saying is he has no, no part in this paganism and this heathenism and, and in all the pagan gods and the multiple gods that the pagans had. Jesus is saying, I have no part in that. It shows his authority and it shows his soul authority, his rule. And his right to say what he's going to say. says that he has eyes like a flame of fire. We sometimes talk about people that have eyes that can burn a hole right through you. I think that's the same idea. What we're talking about, or as you look at the eyes of people, there's something penetrating about that. And in this case, I think there's something that has to do with him passing judgment and him having a right to pass judgment on, on, on who he is. 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 and 8 talks about that, that the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven. Remember this passage? With his angels in flaming fire. Remember that? Taking vengeance. Now, that's not necessarily talking about his eyes, but it's the idea of fire. And here Jesus, in this vision, Jesus talks about his eyes being flaming fire. Talks about how his feet are like, my translation, New King James says, fine brass. Some translations say burnished brass. I like that. The idea of burnished brass is that, 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 that the brass is polished so finely that the glow is magnificent. And I think what, what he's making a point here, it seems to me anyway, he's saying, not only do you look at the top of me and see, see the flaming fire, but he says, you look at the bottom, and what the bottom shows, it shows a glow, and it shows a reflection of who I am totally. And I think what the Lord is trying to get these people to understand is, you're talking, and you're, you're hearing someone who has the authority, not only to be the authority in your life, but to pass judgment on you as well. So I think he paints a picture of himself as he begins this letter to this church. And he says, I want you to know who I am. And he does this in every letter. And you know, again, and, and I don't mean to speculate. I hope this is not speculation. But, but I will tell you, sometimes I think the Lord just making sure we know who he is. Again, I think sometimes we read these things and, and, and sometimes we don't have the grasp and we don't, we don't go back and realize just exactly who Jesus is. And I think what he's doing in each of these letters is he's making sure they have a part of this vision. He's making sure they understand exactly who he is. Well, and we talked about the pattern as we see in a lot of these letters as we began uh, this series a few weeks ago. And the pattern has to do with, with commendations and condemnations and, and warnings and admonitions and some other things. So I want us to think about that tonight, especially as it has to do with commendation. Think about this commendation in verse 19. He says about this church, he says, I know your works, your love, your service, faith, and your patience. And as for your works, the last are more than the first. Isn't this a great description of a local church? He says, I know your works. I know your love. I know your service. I know your faith and I know your patience. Now, I, I don't know that there's any one place in Scripture where you can go 
and, and identify everything that a local church ought to be. I, I don't think you can do it with this verse either necessarily. But isn't this a great commendation of a local church? Here's a church that, that that's it, it, it's in a town in the first century, and, and it's not, you know, it's not what those other cities were, just kind of out there. It's probably a more of a blue-collar type town. And boy, they're about the business of the Lord. And so he says, I know, again, I know. You're not nothing gets by me, but I know your works, love, service, faith, and your patience. But what's interesting to me is he says all of this, he goes back to something. And he goes back in this verse. And what he says is, and as for your works, the last are more than the first. I think this is a great statement. I think it's great because it identifies something that I think is a very important something for us to always remember. There is something about this that tells me that the Lord expected them to, to reach some conclusions about their own work. Evidently, they had been busy. I don't know how long the church had been in existence, but evidently they had been busier, uh, busy. But let me tell you what evidently they did. While they had been busy, what they had determined to do was get busier. You notice that? Because he says, as for your works... The last are more than the first. And what's interesting about that is, is they had, this is, this, is, this is what I think is so impressive about them. Evidently, they had realized this on their own. I, I don't know that he had come to them in a letter before this and said, listen, you need to get busier, you need to accomplish more. I don't know if that's the case or not. But I'll tell you what, they determined that. And what they had decided is, we need to get busier because he says about them something that is very positive is the last are more than the first. And what I love about it is they'd realized it on their own. They'd realized it on their own. They didn't need the Lord to reprimand them in this area. They were self-convicted. And what it tells me is that they continue to think about what it is that we're doing. What is it that we, maybe, maybe there were some things they needed to stop doing. Maybe there were some things that they needed to start doing. But he identifies the fact that they determined what they needed to do. And he's pleased with that. He liked that. And isn't that what every local church needs to do? Isn't this, isn't this what we need to do? Hopefully God has been pleased with us through the years. Hopefully He has been engaged with us and, and, and He's loved what we've done. But you know, what we need to continue to do is say, what more can we do? And when we decide what it is that we can do more of, we need to be doing that. That's what they did. Seems to me that's a great reflection of attitudes where a local church was, was a part of work and said, you know, we've done this, but we can do more. And so that's what they did. And you know, when you look at all these churches, what happens? Local churches either grow or local churches die. It seems to me that's the process. They're either growing or they're dying. And, and, and what's even more interesting about that to me is that that happens with every generation. This is not just what happens in my generation. This is not just about a church maybe that I'm a part of in my generation. Because, you know, if God allows all of us to live long enough, if He allows me to live long enough, at some point I'm going to pass. You know something, folks? I don't know if this church will be, be, be around here when I pass or not. I, I don't know necessarily that this church will be here a year from now. I don't, I don't know that. I would pray that it would be. I would pray that I would be a part of it. But I don't know. And what all of us have to be aware of is that none of us do know. But each generation, everybody who's a part of a local church needs to be making progress, needs to be saying, you know, what can I do to help this work? And I love the fact, I love the fact that God commended them, the Lord commended them because they were continuing to grow. And he says, the, your works, he says, you know, what you've done lately is even greater than what you've done before. That's a good sign. That's a good sign of a local church. And so he commends them. And I think he commends them for a lot of good things. I think he commends them for a lot of good things that from my vantage point, I see us being a part of as well. And I'm grateful for that. And I would commend you for all of those things as well. But he says there's some problems. There's some problems. And in verse 20 he says this, Nevertheless, I have a few things against you because you allow that woman Jezebel 
who calls herself a prophetess to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. Are you as tired about hearing about sexual immorality and meat sacrifice and other food sacrificed to idols as I am in these, in these letters? Are you tired of it? <laughs> now, we're, we're on number four, so you know we're on the downhill slide here now, just so you know, I don't want you to get too bored with this yet. But aren't you kind of tired of that? Well, why do you think that is? <laughs> I think it's that way because there were some serious problems. I mean, we, we just got through talking about a church, a local church, who had all these wonderful things to say, and now he says, nevertheless, i got something we need to talk about. This woman, evidently Jezebel, was being tolerated. Now, a couple of questions in reference to that. Who is Jezebel? Well, I don't know exactly. It could very well be that there was a woman in the church that was leading a group of people into this kind of behavior. It could be that this is, this is what he calls a, an entire group who's, who's a part of this. Or it may be that the woman who's leading this, maybe Jezebel's not her name, but he doesn't want him to forget her. And so he calls her Jezebel. And they would have known the Jezebel of the Old Testament. <coughs> the Jezebel who was married to King Ahab, who killed the prophets of God, who was a Baal worshiper, which was involved in sexual immorality and idolatry, which was the essence of what Baal worship was. And he may just be saying, you know, whatever's going on in this church, it's, just, it's the same thing as Jezebel was involved with in the Old Testament. 2 Kings 9.22 says this about Jezebel's sin. Just listen to this. The whoredoms and the witchcrafts of Jezebel. That's what it's called. And so her sins are summed up with two words, whoredom and witchcraft. I'm going to tell you what. It wouldn't be a good thing to be called Jezebel. And I don't know many folks who name their girls Jezebel. Not if they're trying to do what God wants them to do. Very probably, at least in my mind, there is a woman leading this. She's involved with this in some capacity. But her sins are mentioned here in verse 20. It says that she is teaching sexual immorality. You said she's called herself a prophetess. Now notice this. She's teaching sexual immorality. I don't know how that's happening. I don't know exactly what's transpiring that, but she's teaching that as well as eating things sacrificed to idols. And this passage tells us not only does she teach, and she seduces my servants to commit sexual immorality. Now, if you, you think about this. If we had, we had someone, a person in this church, who was not only encouraging this kind of behavior, but was showing people how to be involved in it, and was seducing them, was doing things to help this process move along. Think about what that could do to hurt a good church. And the Lord's not pleased with it, obviously. And the, the, the problem that I see, and the reason that I said, are you getting tired of all this, is that this was a problem in every church. And may I say something to all of us? Sexual immorality, folks, is a problem in every church today. Every church, it's a problem here. Now, don't misunderstand that you would be saying that. I'm not suggesting that I know a lot of things that nobody else knows, or that... People are coming to me and we've got some huge problem. But I'm telling you, I've been here two and a half years. I can tell you what, we're not different than any other church. And what we've got to do is keep talking about it, keep preaching against it, and keep helping people involved in it to get out of it and to understand you need to repent of what you're doing. And so verse 21, this is the admonition. He says, I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality and she did not repent. Seems to me he may be talking about a specific woman. I don't know again. But whether it's one or whether it's many, I'll tell you what he says. I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality. It seems like there is some, in terms of the tense of the verb here, there's some idea that, that maybe she's refused. I gave her time to repent. She did not do it. And so there's a warning given in verse 22 and on. It says, Indeed, I will cast her into a sick bed, and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation, unless they repent of their deeds, I will kill her children with death. And all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and the hearts, and I will give to each one of you according to your works. Now this, this is not just some warning. This is serious. 
And I don't know everything about this, and, but, but this idea of sickbed appears, appears to me that he's talking about, I mean, you know, I, I've been in a sickbed before. I don't particularly care for it. But when I'm in pain, or when I've had some sort of affliction or disease, or my body's not functioning, it's not working, that's a sickbed. And he says, I will cast her into that sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation. I don't know everything that's involved with that, but I do know this. He's not pleased, and you know it as well as I do. Verse 23 is interesting. I will kill her children with death. It may very well be, but may very well be that there was some immediate consequence. I, I don't know. We're not told as far as I know. But notice what the Lord says about the fact that I will kill her children with death. Here's the reason. And all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and the hearts. Some translations say searches the reins and the hearts. You know what Jesus is saying? He's saying you can't hide from me. He said I know you better than you know yourself. He said, I search the rain and the hearts of men. God knows your deep thoughts. You cannot hide from God. Isn't that a problem among people? Isn't that a problem? We, we somehow convince ourselves that God doesn't know. Or we, we sometimes convince ourselves that you know we're engaged in, in something that we ought not be engaged in and somehow it just doesn't matter to God. And I think what God says here, the very thing we need to understand, He says, I search the hearts and the minds of people. You cannot get away from it. It's not going to just go away. Verse 24 says that some were involved in the deep things of Satan. He doesn't say it in the negative. He says it in the positive. He says, you aren't. But it obviously noticed that the point is is that some people were involved in the deep things of Satan. There are some people that are so involved in this kind of behavior, folks, that I think even they don't think there's a way out. And so he is making sure they understand that I know, he says, I know the problem. Now verse 24 also says that some, some were not involved in these things. And the Lord says to them, I cast no other burden on you. He, he wanted them to maintain their purity. I'll tell you what, my friends. Maintaining sexual purity in our day and age can be a difficult thing. It can be a difficult thing in a, in a workplace with all the innuendo and the statements that people make, you know what? I'm not naive to that stuff. You're not naive to that stuff. Some of you see it on a regular basis. Fortunately, my workplace is not like that. Yes, you would expect. It's not. But I don't work where most of you work. I don't work in environments where many of you work. I don't do that. There are other ways in which I have to guard myself against those very things. But what all of us must do is, is we must understand that we need to avoid anything that relates to this kind of impurity and immoral behavior. And so in verse 25, he says, but you must hold fast. You hold fast what you have until I come. Hold fast what you have till I come. Keep the faith. Don't give in. And then verse 26 and 27, And he who overcomes and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give power over the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron. They shall be dashed to pieces like the potter's vessels, as I also have received from my Father. You know, one of the interesting things to me about these statements about God ruling, this is, I think, is, is, it goes back to Psalm 2. And Jesus ruling the nations. And we're not going to take the time tonight to go back to that. But I, but I think he's, he's pretty much tying that together. It's part of the throne scene. I want you to go to Revelation, the fifth chapter. Just, just go over a couple of chapters to Revelation 5. And I want to read verses 9 and 10. 
This is, again, this is part of the, of the throne scene. But notice what the 24 elders and the living creatures do. That This is uh, with the Lord present. And it says, And they sang a new song saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood. Out of every tribe and nation and people and nation, and have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. Now, that's royal language. That's royal language about Christ, but that's royal language about us. You see that? He says, you have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. Now think, what we need to understand is, as, as even as we live in this life, as Jesus Christ reigns and as He rules, in essence, folks, we rule with Him. We're a part of His kingdom. We, we are royalty. We, we are a part of a, as the, as the Hebrew writer says, and, and as Peter says, we're a part of a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people of God, people who are set apart. We, we are a royalty even now. Can't you imagine, as they're hearing this, he says to them first, he says, you hold fast. Hold fast to what you know you ought to be doing. And if you overcome, and that's the idea of conquering. I really haven't talked about that word as much as I probably should have in these earlier lessons. But the idea of overcoming is the idea of being a conqueror. It's being a fighter and and fighting through the difficulties that you face and ultimately overcoming who the, the problems that you face. And he says, and you keep my works until the end. To him I will give power over the nations. Well, that's who we have. That's who we are. So he wants us to understand that we, in essence, rule with him. And so he gets to verse 20 and he says, and I will give him the morning star. Revelation 22, 16. Jesus calls himself the bright and morning star. Just, Just think about that. A morning star. A star indicates illumination and and it's a morning star. It it, it happens at at, at really a new time. It's a new day. That's the idea. It's a new day. It's a new dawn. And Jesus calls himself this bright and morning star. So he's saying, I will give the person who maintains their purity and who overcomes, I will give him the morning star. He's in essence saying, I'll give you the morning star. And so, he wants them to know, you know, all is not lost. But he says, you, you, are, you are tolerating an influence in your group that is destroying some. Not all, but it's destroying some. And I, and I call this to our attention first because it's there. And second of all, because we need to be aware of it as well. These kind of influences can have a major negative impact in the church of our Lord. We need to be aware of it. I want to mention just very quickly four lessons. These are the things that I would like for you to think about and say, okay, here here are the main things that at least Kenny wants us to get from these. Number one is just get busy. Evaluate and get busy. What we've been doing, what we're going to do. Your, Your later works, your last works are greater than the first. It's not a declaration that they've been bad. It's a declaration that says they got busy. They started doing more. So lesson one, get busy. Lesson two, stay pure. What what a difficult time. And and, and I'm I'm probably, when I finish this series, you're going to say, I hope I don't hear a lesson on sexual immorality for the next six months or six years for that matter. But folks, I don't know of any one thing, I don't know of any one sin, I don't know any one, any one thing that, it, that is having such an impact in the lives of so many Christians. And I'm not just talking about the sexual act. I'm talking about things that relate to that. Things like pornography and things similar to that that are, that are just filling the hearts and minds of a lot of Christians. And so we have to be committed to staying pure. There is another lesson that I think we, that we need to learn, and that is that we don't need to compromise. And I didn't really mention this as much, but you know what I have found out in my research and my study about these is that these, these trade guilds were involved in pagan practices. 
Even what archaeology finds is that there were banquets and other things that were part of these things that people were involved in. And, and really what was asked of Christians is to compromise what they thought. To compromise what they did. To maybe say, you know, well, a little of this is not too bad. And, and what I think we can learn from this is that we don't need to violate biblical principles when we are asked to do things, maybe in our work. I mean, that's what evidently Christians here were, were, were asked to do who were part of, these, uh, a part of this commerce and a part of this trade. And I would just ask you, are you involved in business that maybe ask you to compromise? And I think what we need to do is that, that when we begin to compromise, it destroys influence. And, and whatever application that maybe it is that you need to make, I would hope that you would do that. One, one of my favorite stories that my father-in-law told me was that there was an occasion in his life where he would, was going out to the country club and he was playing golf with some men. And one day those men decided that they were going to play for money. And he was a part of that group. And when they got on the first tee, they decided they were going to play for a dime a hole. And before, before Lester even got to the tee box, they came to him and said, we know you can't do that. But we want you to play with us anyway. And I tell you that story, uh, first of all, because it means so much to me. Here, here was a man who, who was, was playing golf. I don't know if it was weekly or monthly or whatever, but he was playing with a group of men who, who he had some influence over. I don't know if he influenced them to the point where, where they were actually listening to some things that I know he was probably talking to them about, but he was having some influence. And without him having to say anything, they knew, and he knew that he was not going to compromise those principles. That in their minds were already established. And I appreciate that. I'm sure some of you, a lot of you I'm sure have done that very kind of thing. But that's the kind of thing I'm talking about. Let, let, let's don't compromise, whether it's in our business or in our associations or with friends, let's don't compromise the very values that we know are true. The very values that we know God doesn't want us to compromise. <coughs> So I think the application of that particular principle is something that all of us can, can think about. And then finally, let me suggest this. We need to bring forth fruit in keeping with repentance. The call for these people, if they needed to, was to repent. Remember what John the Baptist would say about the Pharisees and the Sadducees in Matthew 3 and verse 8? He says that you need to bring forth fruit in keeping with repentance. If I understand repentance the way I hope I need to. It's not only a being sorry for what I've done, <coughs> but it's a willingness to say I'm going to change what I'm doing. I'm not going to do that anymore. So I just want to make this application in all of that. Is there something in your life that you're sorry that you're doing? Because you know it's something the Lord is displeased with. But are you sorry enough to change what you're doing? Are you sorry about enough? And, and, and you know as well as, as God does that it's something he's not, he, he's not wanting you to do. And you know that. But yet because it's maybe it's an addiction or maybe because it's such a difficult thing, it's hard for you to just move that out of your life. Well, what he calls you to do is if you're going to repent of it, you need to bring forth fruit in keeping it. And the question that I'd ask you and I'd ask myself, do I want to please the Lord badly enough to do what He wants me to do? That's what He's asking these people in Thyatira who weren't doing what they were. He said, I, I, I gave her a chance. And I don't know if there was more chances to be given. And I don't know all those circumstances, but I know He was displeased. And I know this, folks. When we're involved in activities and sins that we ought not be involved with, He's displeased with us as well. And in a world that thinks less and less of sin, talks less and less about it, is affected less and less by it, we need to let a, a church like this and a problem like this just infiltrate our minds so that we go, well, i got to do something. 
And then we need to do that. So, may the lesson of this church, may the condemnation of this church, as well as the commendations, <coughs> affect us as they should. May God help us toward that. And thank you for your attention. If you have a spiritual need, let that be known while we stand. While we stand. I have thine affection and nails in the cross.